the annual event and now given out free via Zoom. Uh, so today we're going to be going through a few marketing concepts which are extremely applicable to the childcare industry. Um, first, just broad introductions. My name is Michael. I'll be serving as your moderator for this event. Uh, I also lead our membership development team for Alliance Core, uh, the shared services based childcare management system. So if you're not using this and interested in knowing more about the system, or if you're already using it and know someone who could benefit from the system, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, here in a few moments, I'll be turning it over to Elsa Sackett and Alicia Mullins, two team members from our early Head Start Child Care Partnership Program. They're gonna be teaching you a couple of these marketing concepts and we'll have a few activities to think on remotely throughout this presentation. Uh, I'm very appreciative to actually have trainers within our organization. Uh, actually, just yesterday, Elsa was helping me work on a, you know, professional goal setting. They're wonderful. Um, now, since we're going to be focusing on marketing today, I also want to just, you know, throw out something that ELV members could be using right now with their own facilities around marketing. Uh, and that's touchless sign-in and sign-out. So, we've got flyers in English and Spanish we can supply you. And uh, as always, we're more than happy to train you on it as many times as it takes. And if you know anyone needing something like this, please tell them because uh, as a reminder, each referral that joins the ELV network on your word is two months of core free for you both. Um, also, if you're in the Zoom and haven't liked our Facebook page, uh, I encourage you to go there and like it. Um, my teammate, Milena, she's collating some of those feel good stories we've heard in our network recently and uh, you know, sharing that out. There's a recent beautiful one about a parent at one of our sites anonymously gifting her car to another parent. It's just more of what we need right now. So, um, okay, I'm going to be turning over to Elsa and Alicia here in a moment so that we can learn. However, before I do that, I do need to once again highlight the PDIS registration. So on Monday, I'm sending the Zoom attendance list over to PDIS. They will need to see that you registered for this event within PDIS. We've put the links inside of the chat as on both Facebook and on Zoom so that you can go and register. You have until the end of today to register for that. Um, and that's so you can get you know, your certificate automatically uploaded into PDIS. But with that, I am going to um, stop sharing. I'm going to make Elsa the host and um, you know, we'll let them take it away. All right. Thank you for your patience. Elsa is now the host. So I'm going to be tapping out and serving as moderator. Let's see. Michael, are we successfully screen sharing? We are. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that intro, Michael. Um, and thanks for all of your efforts to get us officially aligned as a Colorado Shines training with PDIS. You know, it took a minute, but we're really excited that everyone will be able to get those certificates really easily and get credit for being here today. Um, so as Michael said, I'm Elsa and I am the Leadership Development Manager at Early Learning Ventures. And Alicia, if you would like to introduce yourself. Sure. Hi, I'm Alicia and I'm one of the Early Head Start Specialists with ELV, contracted from the Early Childhood Partnerships of Adams County. Glad to be here. <laughs> awesome. Yes. So glad we get to co-present today. Um, so some of you may have attended another module of this curriculum, but it is under the umbrella of strengthening business practices for child care programs. And today we're going to focus on marketing. Um, we're going to definitely work on building up your marketing skills and your knowledge so that you can figure out how marketing efforts can improve your ability to recruit new families and re to retain the business of families already enrolled in your program. The training was developed by the National Center on Early Childhood Quality Assurance with funding from the Office of Child Care and the Office of Head Start, which are both part of the Administration for Children and Families under the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And after the training, we will make sure that you get the slides and a couple other resources, including a workbook that can really help you to make your very own marketing plan via 
email. So again, make sure that you've officially registered so that you'll get that document via email and you can take some next steps. Um, and we'll definitely leave about 10 to 15 minutes at the end for any questions. So feel free to go ahead and put those in the chat. Um, today, we're going to talk about the definition of value of marketing efforts that are focused both internally and externally. I hope that you'll get an idea of how to identify program features and benefits and how each functions a little bit differently as a marketing tool. And we'll explore how data can inform marketing efforts in order to lead you to greater success for your program to become more cost effective and to use time more efficiently. So some of you might remember this slide from our last webinar on budgeting, but we're definitely well aware that most people get into this field because they love working with children. So we get why you picked this line of work. We know that running a business might not be the passion, but we really do want everyone to consider that we want that we definitely need to have strong business practices to create strong businesses, which leads to better outcomes for children. So we definitely want to just take a moment to give this reminder about the connection between the business side and the program side of your work because they just don't exist separately. So without sound business practices, systems, processes, and informed and intentional decisions, your program will suffer. You might spend more time than necessary on the business side, which would take your time and attention away from the good work you want to implement on the program side. Or you might spend too little time on the business side, and over time the resources that your program needs might become depleted. That can diminish the quality of your program or even jeopardize your ability to stay in business. So we want to remember that sound business practices can help you build a strong business in order to dedicate more time and resources to the program. It also improves your stability and sustainability so that you can keep your doors open and serve the children and families who want your services. So we're going to get started with Alicia. Yeah, so let's get started on marketing. What does marketing mean to you? Um, feel free in the chat to type some things that marketing might mean to you. Um, such as, are you continuously thinking about your marketing, the marketing you do in your program, or um, how do you approach marketing for your program? Um, and then we'll talk about if either of these pictures resonate with you too. So um, if you have anything to say about marketing, please feel free to put it in the chat. Um, so I'll just continue. And as we get any, let us know, Michael. Um, so to some, marketing can mean sales, which can really have a negative connotation, um, like a slick salesperson, too good to be true offer. Um, so being pestered like, buy now, buy now, which would be the picture that they're trying to say on, the, on there. Um, to others, marketing can mean the program that communicates the loudest to promote itself. Think um, pestering families, hard selling them your program, convincing families to enroll the children in your program. Um, sometimes marketing can also be confusing, even intimidating process to try and be everywhere and do everything. It can feel time consuming and expensive. Um, so what are your thoughts? Do we have a few thoughts there? Yeah, here, I'll, I'll be the voice of the audience. Uh, yeah, so we got a couple things in. Um, you know, a lot of it um, comes around, a lot of people took it to mean advertising. So, you know, somebody mentioned Facebook being a cost-free way to market your center's environment. Um, you know, advertising in general, while out there are paid or unpaid. Um, to other people, you know, it's more about the, the result. It's about um, getting parents in for a tour or, you know, building out that wait list so that they can maintain full enrollment. So, you know, I guess marketing, some people are viewing at the actual act and some people are viewing it on the like, what is it for? So. Perfect. Those are all parts of marketing. So, um, we're just gonna talk about some different ways today, some of those that you already said and some, <clears throat> some ones that maybe you haven't considered yet. So um, just consider that marketing is a way of connecting your program to families who wanna make the best childcare decision for their children. Um, put yourself in the shoes of a new parent who knows nothing about childcare. Um, how do we think they would feel 
um, we would want to help them find good child care for their child, right? So um, you have a wonderful child care program to offer to families, a safe place for their children to stimulate their minds and bodies. In the Family and Child Care Marketing Guide by Tom Copeland, he writes, too often parents cannot see the difference in a quality program from one provider to another and therefore make the decision based on rates. It's up to us as the providers to show the parents what they are paying for. Um, if it wasn't about a hard sell or being loud or having complicated matrix of marketing, um, we're gonna talk about the focus, to focus and simplify the way that you spend your time marketing. So let's start by breaking down who we're gonna market to. So the first group we'll talk about is external marketing. So some examples of external marketing, as it says here, are prospective families, community organizations and businesses, resources and referral agencies. Um, so those are just some examples of external marketing. The reason that we market to these audiences is to recruit children and families to enroll in our programs and to recruit possible employees for the program. Um, the concept of external marketing is probably familiar to you. It's, it's kind of what we were saying on Facebook or those kinds of things that you put out there. Um, another thought to think about is internal marketing. Internal marketing is, um, some examples would include newly enrolled families, um, existing families, past families, and the staff that you have. Um, what are some reasons that we would mark inter internal audiences? Well, one of the main reasons is to ensure that families are enrolled in the pro program stay in the program, because obviously we want to keep those families once we get them. The distinction between external and internal marketing is that external marketing focuses on recruitment and internal marketing focuses on retaining the families. So it's definitely more cost effective to retain a family until the children age out rather than recruiting, keep having to keep recruit new families. Um, recruiting costs, um, can be high and they um, can take up your time and if space remains unfilled then you're not making that money. You spend more money recruiting people and orientating new family members um, and then transit than you would transitioning in the child that you already have. Um, recruitment costs for new staff are similar than those recruiting for new families and can actually be even more expensive because you have to pay a lot of times to find the staff that you need on those sites. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit more about, more about that later in the training, but the time spent on recruiting is the time you can spend improving the quality of your program, building relationships with children and families, or improving your workplace for the staff. Um, the worksheet that we talked about that we'll be handing out later is a great place for you to mark down some ways that you think that you can um, use your internal marketing with your families. So um, let's dive a little bit deeper, though, into the external marketing. Um, there are two major purposes of external marketing, connecting the program with prospective families communi and communicating the, the program's brand and promoting their services. Um, so if there's anything else you can think of that you would want to, that you would think of to say to your external families, go ahead and put it in the chat and we can talk about it later when we get to that part. Um, Elsa, would you like to talk about um, environmental scanning. Yeah. Thanks, Alicia. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> We're working on the transitions, guys. We are. <laughs> <laughs> so in order to begin understanding where to market externally, it's really important to first understand your community. So to help this understanding, we definitely recommend doing an environmental scan or assessment of the factors that may impact your program. Understanding the community that your program is in really helps you to tailor your services and communications to the specific needs of that community. And it can also help you understand any challenges that might consider your program's success. So environmental factors that we're going to want to consider are physical location. Is it in a rural setting, suburban, urban? Is there highway access nearby? Is it inside an office complex? Is it a separate facility? And then as far as the demographics of the community, we want to get a good idea of what the community is like. Is the population diverse? If other languages are spoken, do we need to have a staff that's 
speaks the other languages that the families in the area speak? What is the income level of most of the families in the area? Um, we do know that in particular, knowing that seven to 10% of income is about what gets spent on childcare is something to take in mind while you're setting your rates. Um, we, you can also contact your local government offices for city and county demographics or look online at the Kids Count State reports that are really full of data. Um, we also want to know if there are any prospective theater businesses. So, for example, if there's a business nearby and it's in an industrial park or close to a hospital, could you create a source of referrals for your families? You want to think about what days and hours are they open? Do they have shifts that come in really early or stay late or work through the weekend? Um, could you offer a discount for families that work at these businesses in order to really build up your base of customers? So you can find that information either just by looking online through your Chamber of Commerce or local Small Business Administration and really even just driving or walking around for a few blocks. It's also important to know if there are other child care options in your area that families might be considering. It's good to keep in mind what ages they serve and what other services they might offer. For example, if they offer transportation or accept subsidies. You're not necessarily looking for this information to compete with them, but rather to identify what makes your program unique and really compelling for families. So you want to figure out what sets you apart and how to differentiate yourself from the other programs in the area. And at the end of the day, not all parents will choose your program, so it's important to know where you fit and who your audience is. Price is definitely another point of comparison, but it shouldn't be the key factor. Um, oh, went too far in the animation. There are ways to find child care programs in your area if you are doing this research. So you can look into the child care resource and referral agencies, you can look through licensing, you could look through your state's quality rating and improvement system. For us, it's Colorado Shines in Colorado. I think most people on are probably Coloradans like us. Um, and you can also look through your state's Department of Education. Another source of information is the state market rate survey. The Federal Child Care and Development Fund regulations require states to conduct a market rate survey no more than two years before they submit a state plan. The survey collects data on programs from providers that contribute the information voluntarily and they make it publicly available. So to wrap up the environmental scan, you don't need a super formal process, but it's really good to have just kind of a placeholder to help you be efficient when updating the information in future years. Um, it might just be a document where you have a table that has four boxes where you fill in what these things are. Ideally, you would do your environmental scan updates every year to identify any changes that might impact enrollment or be useful in making other management decisions. But at the very least, we recommend reviewing and updating every two years. Um, and there will be an environmental scan section on the marketing planning worksheet that you can work on with your teammates at your program and then use to base for research and asking other questions. So we're going to think more about those different elements that we discussed as they relate to your individual program. The next thing we want to focus on is how you build your brand. So if you think about really popular brands that you know, when you think of them, you might think of a visual or a logo. For example, the Apple goes with Apple computers and phones. So think about your program. A business name can be one way to brand a program. The program name might be a strong ref reflection of the program. The terms childcare, or early care and education when used in your program name or brand will have super different meanings to people. So we're not suggesting that you change your program name, but we are suggesting that you think about it critically and think about what message your brand conveys to the public. So if you hear a program name like 
basic babysitting might give you a really different perception of a program than if it's early childhood first steps development center. Sorry, that was an applicant. <laughs> um, <laughs> logos are another way you can brand your program. Um, and they're visual depictions of the brand, and they can also help to convey something about the culture, values, or philosophy of the program. So whether your logo is an image or just your name, whatever it is, be really consistent in how you present it and make sure that it appears on all communications from your center, whether it's letterhead, flyers, advertising, on your website, and on the building. The more people see it, the more they'll they will associate it with you and the more they will remember your center or your business as a family child care home. Mission, philosophy, and value statement are also really important to your program branding. If you don't have a mission statement yet, it can really help to make ones because what you put in these statements tells prospective families what you value and what they can expect once they're enrolled. So if the public knows that you are a nature-centered program, that can be a thing that really differentiates you from a technology-centered program. And you might even consider adding that information to your website so that families can see while they're making the choice between different programs. When you're thinking about your own brand and identity, you want to think about a few different things, really planning a consistent look to the public, Having a name that reflects your program's model, goals, philosophy, and mission. Having a logo that connects to your business. If your logo appears on all of your communications, both online and in print. And it's an image professional yet personal. If you don't have a logo yet, we definitely recommend getting a local designer. Sometimes graphic design students can design a logo for really cheap or free. There are also open source online logo resources and I caution to stay away from trademarked things like Disney related images or anything like that. And now I will turn it over to Alicia who will talk about some features in depth. Yeah, thanks Elsa. So yeah, let's look at the definition of a feature and a benefit. Because um, usually before this, I didn't think about the differences between these. So a feature is um, facts about the service. So they describe what your program is. Um, features tell parents about the attributes of your service. Whereas benefits explain the experiences that the families can expect from your services. They describe what your program does. Think in, inter um, think in terms of results. What results will a child experience from being in your program? That would be more of a benefit. So let's look at this example that they use here. Um, it was it's um, it was at the bottom of that last one, Elsa. It was the storage on the iPod, which nobody uses iPods like that at the MP3 players, but that's okay. So the example would be the feature is that the feature of the MP3 is that it has the one gig storage. The benefit of having the one gig storage is that you can store that many songs on there. So that's, you can kind of think of that as the difference between the feature and the benefit. Uh, now we're ready for the next one. <laughs> so what is a feature versus benefit? Um, let's think about all the features and benefits in terms of childcare programs. On the slide that um, there's an example of a feature. A feature tells us facts. In this case, the fact is that snacks are provided. So we give snacks to our kids. Um, so they tell us what the something is. The benefit of that is um, we provide healthy snacks that support children's growth and brain development during these important early years. So the fact, the feature is we have the snacks. The benefit is what it actually does for the child. So just as you're going through, think about maybe jot it down at home, some things that you think what would be features and benefits of your program? Um, I would try to think of at least one um, benefit for each feature that you have. Uh, and then Elsa's going to talk a little bit more about marketing tools. Mine went fast. <laughs> oh, you're on mute. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry. 
There are many different marketing tools that you may consider using as a program. So for example, to figure out which ones are most useful currently to your program, you might ask new families where they heard about your program. And you can then review that information to understand how people are finding you currently. If you track that information over time, you can prioritize how to spend your time and resources and really only focus on the most effective tools. You definitely don't need to use every single marketing tool out there. We really recommend selecting the ones that work well for you to work smarter and not harder. So we'll go over each of these tools listed. And again, you don't have to do all of them. Pick a couple and do them really well. And leave it at that. <laughs> um, so we wanted to go over a few website basics. If you attended last week's webinar from Tim Rialto of Rialto Marketing, you got a whole lot more information than we're going to give today about websites. And if you did not make it to that webinar, then you can definitely watch the recording. It's posted on our ELV website under resources. I definitely recommend that for anyone who doesn't have a website yet or who might look at improving their own current websites. So websites really create a perception of quality and old outdated websites can give prospective parents the wrong impression of your facility. Old websites can look like you're not up to date on current educational thinking. So you want to make sure that your website really reflects who you are. We did want to go over some traits of a good website and a bad, bad website, but don't panic. It can be a process to sort of transition a website and update it. And if you have a staff member that's really tech savvy that might think it's a fun project, we would definitely recommend delegating. <laughs> um, so we don't want to provide outdated, incorrect information. We don't want photos that don't represent the program well. We don't want it to be hard to navigate. Probably stay away from extreme use of colors or graphics. And we want to make sure that we're not using poor quality graphics or graphics that don't convey the intended message. On the flip side, some traits of a good website are being visually appealing, easy to navigate, it gives resources for parents, for example, resources on nutrition, sleep habits, and reading to children. And providing an explanation of programs and curriculum shown by age groups of children, really highlighting the benefits of your program's curriculum. So in order to think about your own website, you would want to make sure it provides relevant information to prospective families, user-friendly and easy to navigate, even on a phone. If photos are used, do they reflect the community that you're trying to serve? And if you do use photos of children or staff or families, make sure that you have that signed photo release for anyone in your photos and also consider maybe just using stock photos instead. Um, you might want to think about getting positive testimonials from families. You can kind of collect a source of those by providing some kind of incentive. Maybe it's a t-shirt for a child, maybe it's an invitation to an ice cream event. Um, but whenever you're trying to build up your reviews and your testimonials, it definitely helps to offer incentives to get those to come in. Um, we also want to make sure that your website supports to agencies that support and validate the high quality of the program. So for example, if you are a member of the ELV network, you might link to ELV. You might also link to Colorado Shines and include information about your reading. If you're accredited with NACI, you might include that as well as the link. And then you also want to take time to track your website's analytics. For example, like Google Analytics or other analytics programs can tell you how many visitors came to the site and how much time is being spent by users on different pages. So websites can be expensive, so you want to think about how you can reduce the cost wherever possible. Um, if you have a family that attends that has skills in website design, you might work with them. 
and offer sort of a trade and barter. Um, you might also look at our resource platform through ELV. We offer pretty reduced rates for sites through web.com. And Milena Boris, who's on our client support team, will actually help to create that website for our ELV network members. And the first year for that is just $120, and then I think it goes up to about $145 a year. So it's still about $12 a month. Um, the next piece is social marketing. So the goals of social marketing are to connect you to prospective and current parents, to create community, to answer questions, and to share information and expertise. So some current social media tools include Facebook, which I know many of you mentioned. Um, and as you probably are aware, Facebook offers two kinds of pages, public and private. So we would want to target a public business page in order to promote your business to the general public. And a private page is only open to a select group of people by invitation. So it should stay confidential and it can be used to inform current parents about activities and other aspects of center operations. If you're posting on Facebook, remember that you will need permission of parents to post pictures of children. So make sure to build that information about your social media policies into new parent packets. You might also use a Twitter account or an Instagram or a Pinterest. So what do we use social media for? We can provide in our public accounts that are open to sort of the general public and prospective families. So we could do information about our program, whether or not there's available space and current enrollment opportunities. If you're offering a special offer, for example, waiving fees, if there's a special event coming up, information that's relevant and useful to parents. For example, parenting tips, recipes, and activities to play with kids at home. A private page for current families can be used to create more community with current families to share fun things that happened at school. And once again, remember to get that permission to post the pictures. Um, and you can share interesting articles, advice, and suggestions for parents. So how do you choose which social media tools are right for you? We recommend choosing one or two that work for you that you find user-friendly and intuitive and do those two well. It's much better to have one really good social media page on Facebook than to have a Facebook, an Instagram, a Pinterest, and a Twitter, but not post on all four of those regularly. So if you're gonna do it, commit to it. Um, and don't feel bad if you can't do it all. Just pick one or two and delete the rest. <laughs> so how do you know if it's effective? There are tools that measure social media metrics that can help you to understand how effectively you're reaching your audience and how they feel about your brand. So each different site has tutorials on how to use their own analytics. Twitter offers analytics that can help to track the level of engagement your tweets receive, as well as information about your followers. Facebook has similar analytics to track your posts to measure the interactions, and to identify and learn about the people that are engaging with your program's page. There are also other applications that allow you to schedule posts and events and to manage feedback on all the different sites from one place. They can also provide analytics on how successful those social media sites are for your program. So as we all know, the social media landscape is changing regularly. So try to take a minute to step back and use data to choose the social media sites that are effective for your program. Remember, you don't have to be on every social media site. Know your audience, know which site works well for communicating with them, and commit to maintaining that site well. And then we also wanted to go a little bit into email marketing. So email marketing is going to be best when you want to communicate with families using a common tool, since not everyone uses social media. Email can be a little bit more strategic and intentional than the short rapid fire social media posts. 
and it can also feel more personal for private communications. Email tends to be more transactional, like receiving an offer than just social where you're chatting with friends. So don't think about email and social media as being in competition with each other, but think about how you can use them together to maximize your message. So things that we would recommend communicating with email would be newsletters, reminders, and links, possibly special offers to prospective families. For example, you might waive the registration fee if families enroll within a specific time period. We also recommend using email for invitations to events like an end of year celebration or a holiday play. So be intentional about what you are sending, have a goal in mind for the communication, and keep it short and to the point. Make sure your emails work with all devices. And then you might look to see if your email providers, for example, Gmail, offers built-in tools that can analyze the effectiveness of your email campaigns. Um, there are also tools that you can link to your email account to track effectiveness. And an internet search you can do for email analytics tools that will result in several options. We have different metrics that we'd recommend tracking. So the open rate of the email is how many individuals opened that message. The click through rate, which is the number of emails where a person clicked on one or more of the links in the message. The conversion rate which is the number of emails where people clicked on the link and then did the action that you wanted them to take based on the message inside. For example, if you have a link that says click here to enroll and then they complete the inquiry form, that's a conversion. And you can also track the effectiveness of marketing strategies like email by asking people how they heard about a promotion once they've gotten to the final step. So understanding how many families responded or enrolled after you run a promotion can definitely provide insight into its effectiveness and whether it was a good use of time or resources and use that to guide whether you will do it again in the future. And Alicia is going to take over now. Yeah, so the next thing we'll talk about the next form of marketing is word of mouth. Word of mouth is the least expensive and can be one of the most effective ways um, to market your program. Um, anybody can be a positive word of mouth marketing reference. Parents, staff, other community members, um, anybody that's encountered your program, um, your coach, your nurse, any of those people. So um, sharing, sharing with others is a great way for word of mouth. So you might consider providing a cheat sheet for your families to um, help share the benefits of your program. So just put something out to them that tells them what they can say to other families, things that you do already. Um, just be really consistent in your messaging to help reinforce what you want your parents to share with other families. Um, you could also use testimonials. Um, in addition to asking people to talk about your program with others, you can offer them a chance to share their thoughts and testimonials about your program. Um, you can ask for those from parents, staff, and others who have experienced your program. Um, look for statements that'll speak to your prospective families, and then you make the decision to help them make the decision that they want to enroll there. Um, you wanna make sure that you get permission from those families before you use their testimonials though especially if you're using it on social media or your emails or any of those things. Another great way is referrals. Um, if you, you can give incentives to your family for referrals, um, this can help reinforce the word of mouth that you want from your satisfied family. Um, parents may be intentional about endorsing your program when incentives is, is offered. Um, incentives can be anything. For example, um, you can give them a discounted tuition for that month or um, a gift card to a local store or a children's book. Incentives can motivate parents, but they can also be a gesture of thanks for supporting the program. Um, I'm sure that you can think of lots of other ways to incentivize your families, especially if you know what they like. Um, referrals can come from others in the community. Um, might be nice to ask for um, referrals from other reputable individuals and organizations in the community. Let them know what makes your program unique and all the benefits of your program, like we talked about earlier. Um, and this goes into the community re relationships and partnerships that you can make in your community. Um, 
So I'm sure many of you seek out ways to connect with your community, but this is a great way for uh, marketing. Just as we mentioned, word of mouth is a critical component of successful marketing. Um, don't try and do it alone. Your program exists within a community um, and you should connect with it. <laughs> Make sure the program is visible in some way within the community. Get your business name out there so people recognize it as being connected to the community. Um, there are endless ways to connect within your community. Uh, you can host a table or be a sponsor at community events. You can host a community event at your center. Um, I know that's a little hard right now, but we are doing some outdoor things, so you could, you could do something outdoors um, for your community. Attend local town meetings. Uh, share your expertise. For example, you could volunteer for, to speak or engage um, or help out with a community newsletter or put your advertising in a community newsletter. Um, you just wanna join other organizations that have the same shared values that you have in your community. And if there's a large um, employer close to where you're located, you might wanna offer a discount to families who work for that company. That's another way to get in more families or consider establishing a referral program with local businesses that refer employees. That could be a good benefit that companies can offer to their employees. So they might be willing to do it if they um, can offer that benefit for their employees. Consider engaging with organizations that work with new families like hospitals, pediatricians offices, community centers, women's centers, the library, things like that. Um, building community relationships and creating partnerships help to spread awareness of your business beyond just the families that you immediately enroll. Um, the next part of that is talking on the phone. So we just want to talk a little bit about um, phone etiquette, and like the, this little thing here says, hold on while I connect you to ignore. Sometimes you feel like you call places and you don't get great customer service on the phone. So um, the phone is really more of a reactive marketing tool than a proactive marketing tool. So what we mean by this is you don't hold call families to fill in your spaces in your program. However, you do interact with prospective families over the phone. This is why it's really important to think about your phone as a marketing tool. If you don't, you run the risk of underestimating the power of this interaction with prospective families, possibly not giving it enough thoughtful attention and possibly losing enrollment opportunities. Um, if families call or they might tell someone else, um, oh, I called there and they weren't helpful something like that. So let's talk about why it's important. Let's consider what a parent would think if they called and they didn't get an answer, or there was no answering machine when they called, or a person who answered the phone couldn't answer any of their questions, um, or they told them the wrong answers that they then are opposite from what they saw on their website, something like that. So a phone call can be the first personal contact that a family has with the program. If it's a bad experience, then that can affect whether they decide in your program or not. Centers should, uh, excuse me, centers should determine a few key things. Who answers the phone? Ensure that everyone who answers it is trained to answer the phone. Is there a script or guidelines for answering questions? Do you have a cheat sheet of frequently asked questions next to your phone? Um, what information is gathered by the center when inquiries come in? So do you keep data of what kind of questions so you know what answers you need to have ready? What information is shared with inquiries? For example, do you share your rates or other status of your wait list? Um, things like that to think about. Um, we are gonna attach or send out some resources. I also wanted to say that the ELV platform has um, some helpful tips on answering phones too. So you can check on the ELV resource platform. Um, they seem obvious, but they're just things you just need, you don't think about on a regular basis probably on how those are happening. Um, so it might be a good idea to review those at your staff training. So anyone that's answering the phone or could be answering the phone knows that too. Um, so, because you never get a second chance to make your first impression. Um, so that really goes along with those phone calls. Um, have you, we've probably heard this quote before, but if ever thought about it before, you know that what you say in the beginning makes a first impression. Um, so think about what feeling families get when they first enter your center. Do they immediately feel welcome? 
Do they see evidence of the things that you value? Um, let's talk about some of the factors that contribute to these impressions. Uh, the lobby, um, or if you're a home provider, even just your entrance into your house. Uh, what does it feel like? Is it organized? Is there someone to greet them when they get there? Is there someone to sit um, if they have to wait? Are there photos of children and families? Are there colorful pictures when they come in? Um, so just thinking about those things when the families enter your site. Also, um, think about touring. I know that right now we might not be doing a lot of that with the COVID stuff going on and letting people in to tour our sites, but um, think about offering tours and maybe think about offering virtual tours. This is something you could do. Um, you could film yourself walking around the center or just film yourself or someone talking about the center. This could be a good way to um, get testimonials out too. Um, if you have parents or families or staff willing to do that. Uh, think about how you would offer that. Are you going to offer it at different times for people to come in in a safe way? Or are you going to, if you do do it virtually, what will that look like? Um, planning is the key to success. So be prepared and take the time to get all your resources and everything ready. Um, also get all your forms ready. So if you are going to do it virtually, do you have all those forms virtually that you can send out after they take their virtual tour? put things into who delivers to, so just put your thought into who's going to do that tour so that they are well, they're knowledgeable and know about your um, program. Um, have, if they are gonna do it, have they received training on giving a tour? Be aware about how you talk about the times that are not ideal, have talking in points ready for staff to use. So if a parent asks an uncomfortable question, think about how you'll answer those questions. Um, Along with sending things digitally, just making sure that you have printed materials. What printed materials do you already provide? Um, do they need to be updated with current information? Uh, again, do they need to be digital now so that we can send them out and people don't have to come in and get them? Um, what do they look like? Do they have your logo on them? Things that we've talked about before. Do they have benefits of being at your site? Um, things like that. Uh, then you also want to think about confirming enrollment. Uh, what are your next steps to follow with your prospective families? For example, you should thank them, obviously, for visiting or for taking your tour. You can send them a thank you note or a thank you email or a thank you call. You should also make yourself available for more questions or whoever is answering the phones available for more questions. Um, it's best to create a schedule for follow-up so that you remember to get back to those families. Um, this will make steps clear to staff members and also help prevent communication lag. First impressions matter. Take the time to think through the impressions that families, prospective employees, and community members will have when they walk into your program for the first time. And now Elsa might talk a little bit about internal marketing. <laughs> yes. Um, just to be transparent, we are running a little bit close on time. So this is going to be a super abbreviated version of internal marketing. You will still get all of the information in your slides and please feel free to reach out. We also work with the client support team to see if, if we can offer a part three marketing webinar down the road. <laughs> I'm going to fly through this and hopefully cover the most important points. <laughs> um, so internal marketing is really where we think about how to market to our new families, our existing families, our past families, and our staff. When we think about the goal of internal marketing, we want to remember that marketing should continue even after families are enrolled, and there are some key shifts in mindset here. So with internal marketing, we're not trying to recruit new families. We're trying to retain the families that we currently have. It's a lot more cost effective to retain a family until children age out than it is to recruit a new family for an unfilled spot. If you think about all of the revenue that is lost with an unfilled spot, the administrative time to process all the paperwork around a new enrollment, and the adjustment time for the classroom transitioning a new child in, there's a lot that has to happen. Definitely want to have a positive family experience and high quality child care to retain that family. 
from offering a service to building a relationship with our enrolled families. So this is an emphasis on retaining the families that are enrolled, and the goal should be to retain as many families as possible until the children are ready to move on to school. Is engaging families in regular communication that allows them to voice their thoughts on what works well and what needs improvement. It requires our leaders to listen to what they say, identify trends, and then take action to make improvements when necessary. Um, so with new families, we, oh, all right. I think that's back to Alicia. <laughs> You want it to is. really quick. Um, Michael, what do you think? Should we continue with the rest that we have here? Or should we stop for questions and we'll just probably send out the slides? And sorry, we didn't get to finish it all. What I would advise is to just power through as much as you can. Um, okay. If anybody does have very, very pertinent questions, um, you know, you we'll be sending that post webinar messaging. You can reply to that. I'll get that over to Alicia and Elsa. Um, and also, you know, one of the things we'll be calling out in that post webinar messaging is like office hours for our EHS staff for ELV team members. So, um, you know, I think we power through as much information as we can now. And uh, if you feel like you have specific needs needing addressed, you'll reach out to me. Perfect. Okay. So we'll go through quickly. We'll try and get it all done. Um, just marketing. So we talked about marketing to external. So this is marketing to new families. Um, just thinking about a new family enrolled in your child care program for the very first time. How are they feeling? What might they be paying attention to? So some good ideas is to just um, check in with your families. Um, check in again through emails, through calls, um, However, you can check in with them. I'm trying to get through quickly. Support them during their transition into the program. Answer all of their questions they may have. Um, let them know that you value them. Um, welcome them to your program in any way you can. Uh, so you want to make sure that you, of course, greet them on the first day. Make introductions to the staff. Um, again, this could be hard during these times when families may not be coming into your center. So a good idea might be to send out pictures and bios of the staff that your children are going to have in their classroom to make them feel welcome and know who their children are going to be with every day. Um, do a personal check-in after 30 days. Call new families to check in on them, I think I already said. Um, ask them how their transition has been. Um, what do they like so far in the center? What's worked really well and what um, maybe are some things that they're struggling with or have questions about. Um, and then after 90 days, send out another survey to see how they're doing after 90 days um, so that you can ask more questions to provide information about what's working and what they may have questions about. Um, remember that you're not just providing a service, you're building a relationship with every one of your families and children. Um, create this opportunity for working with families to connect with others similar to themselves. So having events together, if possible. Um, and on the next slide, we have a little bit more um, information about communicating regularly. We talked about conduct annual parent conferences surveys, um, offer incentives for referrals, which we talked a little bit about. So um, that would be referrals, not just for, um, that can be for new families too, giving referrals, start a parent advisory group, share resources with parents, host social events for families. And then a great idea is to send thank yous out to your families after they've been there um, at the end of the school year or at a holiday time. Um, and then the next part would be marketing to past families. So just remembering that once they leave, they're still a part of your program and you can use them to, um, to do some marketing for you. So again, testimonials is a great way to do this. Um, you can also do incentives where you can send them if they refer someone gift cards or um, books or things like that. Um, but it's just another way to um, market using the resources you already may have. And then Elsa can talk a little bit about marketing to your staff, if we have time. Yep. Um, so the reason we want to think about marketing to staff is because staff can really be a program's greatest asset or their biggest liability, depending on what's going on there. The staff see your children and families every day, 
and not necessarily under the supervision of the program leader. The family's overall experiences with the program are really highly influenced by their experiences with staff. And the staff members who your families interact with will really have a strong effect, positive or negative, on whether families are happy with your program. So we want to remember that academic degrees or credentials don't ensure that families will have a positive experience interacting with a staff member. They need to be appropriately trained, motivated, and have a good attitude. Parents also talk to other parents. So if parents are happy with the staff in their classroom, other parents will hear about it even if their child is not in that classroom. And that also goes for unhappy parents. Um, so for marketing to staff, we really suggest in investing in professional development, making sure to pair people up as mentors and coaches, um, maybe forming a book group to discuss an article or book to build knowledge, and encourage staff to take on leadership roles within the program, whether that's in staff meetings or in planning events for families. We also really want to communicate the values, mission, and philosophy of the program to your staff, just like to your families. We want to have regular staff meetings so that staff feel like they're part of something bigger. Um, everyone kind of wants to feel connected to a purpose, so building the community and having those interactions can help with that. And then you definitely want to communicate regularly and also help to control any messaging that goes out to families by communicating first to your staff so they don't get surprised. Um, you definitely want to appreciate your staff, whether that's through an appreciation week coordinated with families, um, creating a social space where staff can come together outside of work, and that will help them to feel a deeper connection to the program and stay in their positions for longer, in addition to saying really positive things about the work that they're doing to the families. Um, so again, retaining good staff is less expensive than recruiting good new staff, which is why we really focus on that. It saves you recruitment time, it saves you admin costs, costs of substitutes, time of orientation, and all that. Um, the end! Hooray! We're right on time! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no worries. I, I think what we should do um, to close it out, um, so I, Elsa and Alicia, I do believe you had one other little um, you know, interactive that we had planned that we weren't able to get to. So I'm wondering if, you know, we could ask people to just sort of think on it as they, you know, exit the webinar today. So Elsa, would you mind sharing that interactive? Yep. So on your way out, before you jump back into the daily responsibilities, we would ask that you take a couple of minutes to just jot down three things that you plan to follow up on in your program. Um, things that you thought were news, that you're like, hmm, I need to look into that more, things that you want to take action on. Um, and again, the slides will be coming your way along with a whole planning worksheet. So the actions could just be review the slides and start the planning worksheet. But yeah. we'll take next steps and reach out if we can support you in doing that. Awesome. All right. Well, um, you know, the one other thing that I do want to highlight, uh, again, is also our resource platform. You'll be getting a, um, a copy or uh, access to our resource platform in the post webinar training if you haven't signed up. Um, and so there is a ton of marketing info in there as well. Um, but because, you know, we are now cresting past two, I'm just going to be closing out the, uh, the meeting and I'll be getting um, the post webinar messaging out to all of you in about 30 minutes to 60 minutes, somewhere in there. And so if you do have any questions, please feel free to write me. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend. And we'll see you next time. Thank you so much.